The relationship between central and local government has never been easy, but it's turning into a critical factor for the development of New Zealand's first super city in Auckland. Most of the heat's being generated by transport issues. Auckland and Wellington wrangle over the billions of dollars required to upgrade the road and rail systems and public transport services. But the differences run much wider than that. Parliament's youngest MP is in a unique position to observe Wellington Auckland politics in action. He comes to the capital having spent more than two terms as an Auckland local authority councillor. At 26 years of age, he's now Deputy Chairman of Parliament's Transport and Industrial Relations Committee and its Law and Order Committee. Jamie Lee Ross, the National MP for Botany, has been sharing his views with Selwyn Manning. Uh, welcome to the programme, Jamie Lee. Thanks, Selwyn. Appreciate it. I'm at 26 years of age. Um, you're Parliament's youngest member at the moment, and uh, there's this ironic twist that due to your experience in local government, you're probably the most experienced in local government that the National Party caucus has at the moment. And what's it, what's it like being the new kid on the parliamentary block, if you like? Oh, everything you do in life is a learning curve. It was a learning curve when I first got into the council and even though I'm into my eighth year in politics now as an elected representative, I'm still Parliament's a, a huge organisation. I'm still learning a lot, but I'm loving it, enjoying it. I appreciate the opportunity that my constituents have given me to represent them in Parliament. It is a huge privilege and um, I hope they, they understand that I do take their uh, vote seriously and, and doing the best I can to represent them. Yeah, so you know in times past, people that didn't subscribe to the old boys network and things like that. Uh, women, for example, found it a hard road getting recognition and certainly leverage within the parliamentary system and within their own parliamentary caucus in some respects. Have you found any of those blocks? Well, I think with Parliament it's very much a case of you have to uh, earn your stripes, work your way up uh, before you gain more influence. You can't ever expect to go into Parliament and expect to change the world all at once. And unless you're a superstar like John Key or Stephen Joyce, you do have to work your way up from the bottom. But look, I'm a young person. Um, I hope to be involved in politics for some time. I hope that I would be in a position later on to have uh, some more influence around the place. But I'm very much enjoying being the member of uh, Parliament for Botany. The National Party does have a good uh, track record of consulting with the caucus and um, certainly uh, backbenchers like myself are able to work very well with ministers. Okay, in uh, what way do you earn those stripes in that kind of dynamic? Well, I think it's a case of uh, one being a good constituency MP and uh, ensuring that you're representing well the views of your constituents in the parliament and within the caucus. So if you were um, going to um, name, say, two things that you had a win on, um, what would they be? Well, you can go from very small things to, to very large things. At, at the smaller end of the scale, you know, just sorting out someone's immigration issue uh, is, is a small win uh, for myself as an MP, but it's a big win uh, for the constituent. And then at the other end of the scale, you can have, uh, for example, a school. Um, I've got a school in my electorate with a few uh, building issues. I'm working on that with the school and the minister, and uh, we're getting some good inroads there. So being a, an MP in the government caucus do, yeah. does give you the ability to get some inroads with the ministers and get some wins for your constituency. So you, for example, um, because you're a part of a national caucus, um, you would get you would expect more wins than, say, somebody who is representing people on the other side of the Great, great South Road in well, South it, Auckland. There has to be some benefits to being <laughs> a, a member of the government caucus. Um, and I think that access to ministers is probably helpful. Mm -hmm. But being able to work on government policy through caucus committees is important. Local government, for example, um, the minister, previous minister Nick Smith and now David Carter, they work quite closely with their caucus committee and we're able to put it, have input into the policy program, the legislation that's coming up. And that's of uh, real value as a constituent member being able to get into those areas. OK, so let's look at lo local government. Sure. Uh, once again, you know, you, you, you were elected um, twice to Manukau City Councillor from the age of 18 and returned right. again the, the next uh, parliamentary um, uh, um, uh, turnover. Um, and, and you were elected to the Auckland Super City Council um, in that first area and then won botany, which put you down into there. So what, what, in your maiden speech, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make um, a couple of things here. Um, in your maiden speech, you said, I'm a staunch believer in, in limited government. Yep. Um, you also said, um, it has been my observation during time as a city councillor that as politicians we have a natural tendency to want to legislate or regulate, often in a way that limits the freedoms of everyday New Zealanders. Yep. I suppose my question here is, um, why is the national-led government moving to give itself more power at this stage over the country's councillors 
uh, with the legislative reform in local government. You'll note that I was talking about everyday New Zealanders and councils are a creature of statute. Councils have the power to tax people, councils have the power to make regulations over everyday New Zealanders because parliaments passed mm. laws to allow them to do that. We've taken the view that we think councils have gone too far in the areas of becoming involved in. Uh, they've gone too far with how much they're taxing people, how much debt uh, they're racking up, and we think the people, uh, the people who end up paying the bills at the end of the day, do want councils to have some more limits on their responsibilities, on their powers, and have greater government oversight. Now, I don't see that uh, the, the government's legislation in the area of local government is at odds with my maiden speech at all. I think it's in fact uh, uh, quite good for the government to be uh, having some greater controls over local councils because councils are taxing uh, far too much, they are rating far too much, they're racking up far too much debt. In 2002, when the power of general competence was brought in for councils, we saw councils start to spend a lot more than they were previously. Let this me is, give you some numbers. This is the line that uh, Nick Smith, your caucus colleague, former Minister of Local Government, Absolutely. justified it's, it's the It's worth looking at just a couple reform. of numbers before um, we go a bit further. Mm. Prior to 2002, in the 10 years prior to 2002, rates were going up by 3.9 per cent. When uh, the 2002 Act was going through, uh, Parliament was told uh, by the government of the time that there would be no greater increases in rates, no great increases in costs. In fact, since 2002, we've seen rates go up by 6.8%, mm. 3.9 versus 6.8. Mm. Councils started spending a lot more. Uh, debt has quadrupled mm. from mm. 2002 to 2012, yeah. I, I get from your, 2 billion to 8 billion. I, we think councils are a bit out of control. I certainly get your point there. I guess what I'm testing here is this ideal of <laughs> liberty that yep. yourself and many others in the National Party caucus suggest is the way to go in many cases. Um, particularly, you know, the ideal in the uh, previous national-led governments of, of the 90s where the market would lead, you know, and liberty within the markets would dictate the direction and the benefit and prosperity of the country. If, if you're looking at it from a local elective kind of point of view, or the local constituency point of view, there are obviously pockets in New Zealand that have very, very parochial kind of areas. Um, Auckland, Christchurch, Canterbury, for example. Many there would see the expression of their vote as an expression of liberty. And if they see centralised, don't is, is there a case where if they see centralised uh, control starting to develop from Wellington or the Beehive, that is something that they would naturally resist. Do you think they should resist that to a degree? Well, by regulating further the power of local government, you are in fact increasing the liberty of the person who's paying the bill, the everyday New Zealander. And yes, uh, councils are held accountable every three years uh, at the ballot box, just as we are as MPs. Uh, but, but I'd say my constituents would also feel as though, uh, even though they're voting for the council, they're like us as parliamentarians, the people who put in place legislation like government works under, to be having more regulations on what councils are doing as well. And so where we have this legislation coming through, we're not saying to councils, uh, you won't be able to do these things and you will be able to do these things. What we're saying is they need to narrow their scope a bit more. They've, got, they've broadened it too far after the 2002 reforms. The power of general competence allows them to do pretty much anything they want. We don't think everyday New Zealanders want councils to be getting involved in things that central government already mm. gets involved in, things like education, like climate change, things that the Auckland Council's right. striving to have some so influence So you give them over. a list of perimeters and where they can work? Well, no, what we're doing is we're saying to them, your scope should be narrowed. What you should be focusing on is core public infrastructure, public services, and your regulatory functions. If it's still the... down to, to, to interpretation as to what they yes. are, but uh, as a principle, they should be narrowed yes. down. There's a second part that we touched on, obviously, before, relating to the fiscal prudence requirements yep. of the, ref yeah, the reform, if it is enacted into law, and one ex would expect it would be, um, that it will be enforcing that aspect. What, what interests me there is um, how will the new legislation equip the beehive, if you like, in its, in its bureaucracy, to actually enforce these measures on councillors, should you believe, or central government believe, uh, that the uh, local councils are rogue to your interests or your, your new act? I mm. wouldn't say rogue to our interests, rogue to the interests of New Zealanders. Uh, the act sets up a mechanism whereby the government, in consultation with local government New Zealand, can put in place fiscal responsibility requirements. 
and on top of that you have to uh, have in place some ability for um, the Minister of Local Government to hold councils to that fiscal responsibility requirements. At the moment you, the government has pretty much two options, do nothing mm. or the nuclear option of sacking a council. We don't think that's enough. There should be some options in between uh, do nothing and the nuclear option. Uh, things like having a, a Crown monitor to sit there alongside a council uh, to monitor what they're doing and give them some advice on it. Uh, that worked particularly well in Christchurch when we did that. We were only able to do that because Christchurch asked for that. Mm. Uh, but having some uh, government involvement without completely sacking the council will give, uh, particularly those smaller councils, Kuiper's in a bit of mm. difficulty at the moment, I'll okay. give those smaller councils some assistance, some monitoring, some review outside of their own internal structures I, I get to the give us the ability yeah. to, to have some influence. I get that rationale. What, what I'm kind of wondering is, is if a council is not performing at all, um, like for example, let's look at Auckland at the moment. Um, Auckland is right out throughout the super city region uh, last week received rates indications on the increases or otherwise that their rates bill is going to kind of be mm. in the next mm. 12 months. Mm. In some pockets it was in excess of 30% yeah. increases. Um, if this new act came into play, what would it do in this case to Aucklanders? Mm. Would it mm. say we're going to step in here and we're going to stop these types of rate increases from coming about? Mm. I think the first point I'd like to make is there is quite a difference between a council failing and not performing uh, and then government disagreeing with the policy decisions mm. the council's made. So in fairness to Auckland, I wouldn't say the council is failing or not performing. I'd say that uh, the council's taken some policy decisions that uh, a large number mm. of Aucklanders disagree mm. with it, and personally as an NPR I'd disagree with but too. How would, the, the, act yeah, yeah, How would yeah. the act change things? How change things? It would narrow the scope uh, of what the Auckland Council should be getting involved in and the council would have those fiscal responsibility requirements to work alongside. Now inflation the, over the next four years... Yeah, before we get into inflation though, I just wanted to make a suggestion here. The, like, the argument coming from Auckland Council is, is that it's moving to the capital rates based rating system and that that was a requirement of the laws that the National-led government and Act passed last year, oh, sorry, in 2010 mm. for the super city structure, that these increases are actually the responsibility and they came as a consequence of the laws that the National-led government passed. What, what's your response to that? Uh, I'd reject the argument that the problems they're having are due to transition because the councils, every council including Auckland has a large range of tools that they can use under the Rating Act that Auckland, Cut is, services for Auckland is not using. Yeah. No, they're rating tools. So there's things like a uniform annual general charge. The higher yeah. that is, the smoother the impact is. There are things like targeted rates they could use a lot more. Now the problem with transition, the problem with uh, property value related uh, big decreases or big increases is because a large portion of Auckland's rates are on based on value. The council can use tools like the UAGC to reduce the value part of the rate. But Targeted rates can also end, do that as well. At and the so end of the day, they are moving, aren't they, to what was instructed to them by way of legislation. But whether they are moving to annual value, land value or capital value, there would still be a transition mm. that would have to have been gone through. What I'm saying is they're not using the tools completely that are available to them. For example, the uniform annual general charge has been set at 12.5%. In Waitakere, which is arguably one of the most left-leaning areas in Auckland, they had a 30% UAGC. That reduced the impact of valuations on Waitakere ratepayers. Manukau, where Len came from, we had a 24% UAGC. We had that at a higher rate than the 12.5% they're at now because we recognised that having a valuation-based rate very large portion of it being based on valuation had quite big impacts on people okay. by having a higher UAGC that could have smoothed the transition a lot easier. Jamie Lee Ross, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate being here, Selwyn. Selwyn Manning with Jamie Lee Ross, former Manukau City Councillor, short-term member of the new Auckland Council and now National MP for Botany. And that's all from the recent interview. We're back in a week's time with an extended interview with Auckland's Mayor Len Brown. Till then, thanks for your company and bye for now. Supporting local content. 
so you can see more of New Zealand on air.